Mr. Speaker, will the 30s go down as the decade which witnessed the destruction and downfall of the British Empire? Hmm. That witnessed the wanton self-destruction of the British Empire. If India were granted uh, self-government, it would mark the downfall of the British Empire. It will mark and, uh, and consummate the downfall of the British Empire. On the way. Do something about Miss Sarah's gramophone. I don't want to start the day with another family altercation. No, madam. Hello, mummy. Good morning, darling. Inches, kindly tell my daughter to turn off that bloody gramophone. Trashy music all over the house. There you go, sir. She knows I can't stand it. Why does she do it? Leave it to me, sir, will you? Have you been drinking? This time in the morning, sir? Certainly not. We have, I hope it's your damn whiskey and not mine. Uh, what time is Mrs. P coming? Early afternoon, sir. Early afternoon? Why not this morning? Because you told her not to come till after lunch, sir. For your invention, I did nothing of the sort. You said you were going to town this morning, sir, so she would not be required until after lunch. Well, I've changed my mind. I need to redraft this speech. Get her here now. Yes, sir. Thank you. Is this Churchill? This is Landry. Good morning, madam. Something the matter? What's wrong? Uh, it's Mr. Monks, madam. Butcher? Uh, yes, madam. It seems we haven't paid his bill for several weeks, and he says he'd rather not provide us with any more meat until the account's settled. Oh. <sighs> I'll write a cheque, and you can send one of the girls to deliver it. Thank, Thank you, Mrs. Thank Landry. you, madam. Inches! Liver salts! Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Randolph, you look dreadful. Thank you, Mama. All this double brand is late last night. Not in the same league as my beloved papa. It's very bad of a young man of your age to drink so much. Oh, don't much. start nagging at this time of the morning, please. Let me wake up first. We did. Kingston, have you paid Mr. Monks? Where, what? The butcher from Westrum. Have you paid his bills? My dear Clemmy, I'm trying to save India from Mr. Gandhi and his gang of subversive Hindus to save British imperial power from a disastrous eclipse and save the Tory party from an act of shame and dishonor. In other words, you haven't paid the bill. For God's sake, woman, I can't do everything. Change his mind. Oh, I do wish he wouldn't do that. I'd arrange to take the girls into Westrum to buy some shoes. Heaven knows when I'll get another opportunity. <sighs> Mr. Churchill? Ah, Mrs. B at last. Good morning. We have much to do and very little time in which to do it. Inches, please tell Mr. Churchill I've decided to go to town with him. What time will he be leaving? 11.30, madam. On the dot. I uh, will revise this speech and uh, go on to the second chapter on the way up to London. Today? Anything wrong with that? No. No, of course not, Mr. Churchill. And bring my notes for the Battle of Blenheim. There you are, Clemmy. Did I keep you waiting? 
Not more than usual. Good morning, Mrs. Morning, Chatter. Jenna. How are you, Mrs. P? Well, I think you're happy as a clam, aren't you, Mrs. P? Don't you let him boss you about. He's a dreadful boy. Nonsense. Mrs. P adores me. <laughs> How are you getting on with the Duke of Marlborough? Very well. Volume 2, Chapter 20, The Battle of Blenheim. We're already on page 800 and something. I think the publishers hope for something a little shorter. Bugger the publishers, this is more than a biography, it's a paragenic. A tribute to my great and illustrious ancestor. Oh, get her, move on, Jenna. Overtake, overtake! Remember when... Randolph and I went off to see the battlefield. Of course. Oh, I dreamt about it last night. I could say everything. I mean, the enemy being routed, Europe saved from those ravaging hordes. And there was Marlborough riding into history. And I met. I think, I think he smiled. You shouldn't have had so much cheese. Stilton always gives you nightmares. <laughs> Mrs. Speaker, the loss of India would mark and consummate the downfall of the British Empire. If we cannot do our duty in India, we should have shown ourselves unworthy to reserve the vast empire which still centers upon this small island. It is alarming and also nauseating to see Mr. Gandhi, a seditious Middle Temple lawyer, now posing as a fakir of a type well known in the East, striding half naked up the steps of the vice regal palace to Pali on equal terms with representative of the King Emperor. Pendant councils, private members' bill, second reading. Not bad, yeah? No. That sounds very easy now. Thank you, Tom. What a monstrous speech. You're his friend, Bracken. You should tell Winston to stop making such a fool of himself. It's pathetic. Britain is losing her grip on its imperial affairs. He's trying to stop the rot. <laughs> Rubbish. Winston's a self-serving opportunist. That's why nobody trusts him. No sense of loyalty. Thanks, Tom. Does this party count for nothing? Is it disloyal to defend something one believes in passionately? He's attacking government policy, which means he's attacking his own damn party. It's about time he towed the line and stopped being such a bloody nuisance. It's the wrong hat, Tom. Mr. Woods, this is appalling. You must remember that your husband lost a very substantial sum as a result of the Wall Street crash. A bankrupt? Not exactly. But I have made it clear to your husband that economies are necessary. What did he say? He promised to cut down to three bottles of champagne in the evening. There was a time when people used to rush into the chamber. Do you hear me speak? It's Winston, they cry. Winston's on his feet. Now they hurry away, as if to avoid an, an embarrassing accident. You finished, Brendan? Nonsense. A ghost witnessing my own demise. Desmond, have you met my husband? Oh, briefly at the wedding. Good Desmond. to see you. 
Oh, I'm so Maybe glad to see you. Mm. Hello, Morton. How's the spying game? I'm not a spy, Randolph. I'm a civil servant. Yes. Where's yes. your father? I'm afraid he's having a black dog day. We're relying on you to shake him out of it. He came really? back from London in a terrible mood, and he's been like that ever since. Mm. Winston. Go on, Winston. Lunch in five minutes. Dogs look up to you. Cats look down on you. Pigs treat you as equals. What is it? India? Hardly. Hardly these. What about them? Well, look there, Hitler. Made me think. In 35, I was Home Secretary. 37, First Lord of the Admiralty and 50, Chancellor of the Exchequer. Doing pretty well. Not bad. Now look at me. No power. No prospect of power. Look at Hitler. From bugger all, the head of state in 10 years. Come and have some lunch. Not hungry. Everyone's waiting. Let them wait. Come and have a drink, at least. What have you got there? I'll show you indoors. They cheer me up? Not exactly. You may be right about Germany. What do you mean? What is all this? It's a report from our air attaché in Berlin. He says the Nazis have in training over 8,000 pilots. Sounds as if Hitler is creating an air force. I would say so. Yes, but the Prime Minister would not. God help us, Desmond. England is lost in a pacifist dream. People prefer that to the nightmare of war. Passchendaele and the Somme are all too close for comfort. Yeah. People are dreaming, it means they're asleep. Time they bloody woke up. Mr. Baldwin, Prime Minister. Herr Becker. My government is very displeased by a number of scurrilous and totally unfounded attacks on the Third Reich that seem to emanate from the office of your ambassador in Berlin. So, Robert? Yes, I'll, uh, I'll make the appropriate inquiries. Well, if it's true, we shall take immediate action. I deplore any attempt to create feelings of doubt and suspicion. I am anxious to work closely with Germany under the new order. Thank you, Mr. Baldwin. Mr. Wickram, perhaps you will let me know the results of these inquiries. The most recent dispatch from our ambassador reported that Nazi policy is intensely anti-Jewish. Is that scurrilous and totally unfounded? The Jews have become far too prominent in many aspects of German life. Their influence is disproportionate. Our policies are merely adjusting the balance. Is that why you built a concentration camp outside Munich? It's a place of protective custody, Mr. Wigram. And remember, please, it was the British who invented the concentration camp during the Boer War. I believe. We are merely following your good example. Jolly good what you said in there. Nothing but bully boys, these damn Nazis. Well, they get away with it, that's the trouble. Nobody does anything about it. That's right, they don't. Very alarming. It is. Desmond Morton. Rafe Wigram. Foreign Office, Central Department. Oh dear, I'm sorry. Have we met before? I'm, I'm terrible at faces. I'm afraid it's my training, military intelligence. I have a filing cabinet instead of a mine. <laughs> I'm going to Charing Cross. Can I drop you somewhere? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much.
dish. I think she wants to do it professionally. I think she wants to do it professionally. Annoying people? No, the stage. Nonsense. Girls on the stage to marry into a good family. Sarah already belongs to a good family. Ladies do not become chorus girls. There's no cake. Pardon, sir? You've forgotten the cake. There isn't any, sir. That's what I'm telling you, silly girl. No, we don't have any cake, Winston. That's what she means. Don't have any cake? Of course we have cake. Dundee cake from Fortnum's. Thank you, Peggy. Yes, ma'am. What on earth's going on? We have to make economies, Winston. What are you talking about? I'm worried about money. I went to see Mr. Woods. Four queens. Why? He's my accountant, as well as yours, Winston. Could have told me we could have gone together. I wanted to see exactly how bad things are. Mm. Could be worse. That's the answer. We've got the most enormous overdraft. Look, well, we're paying it off. No, we're not. For God's sake, Clemmy, I'm working day and night. All these articles of the Evening Standard, Marlborough. Not to mention the constituency work. I know. That's why we have to economize. It's like depriving me of my Dundee cake. You're paying all of Randolph's debts. R Randolph is hopeless with money. We all know that. Oh, he's irresponsible. I'll talk to him. It's your turn. What? It's not. It is. is. Come along. You just won the last trick. Zeke, double bezik. Well, score it. Double bezik, 500 points. Winston, I know how we'll, to score. We'll do it. It's not just Randolph, it's this house, it's Chartwell. That's where all the money goes. All right, all right, we'll we make economy. 18 people here. Surely not. It's ruinously expensive. We should never have bought oh, it. Oh, don't start that again, please. You went behind my back. I did not. You knew I didn't like it, and you deliberately deceived me. That's not true. I never saw such an ugly house. You may find the house ugly. I do not. Anyway, that's beside the point. Come with me. What for? I want to show you something. Don't change the subject. I'm not. Come with me, please. That's why I bought it. Not because the house is beautiful, but because of that. What you can see from the house. England. Look at it, Clemmy. Nowhere in the world could you find a landscape more ravishing than that. And it's ours to look at and to cherish for the rest of our lives. I would die for it, Clemmy. Welcome news, I'm afraid. The cabinet has decided to sell aircraft engines to the Germans. I don't believe it. To be precise, 118 Rolls Royce PV12 Merlins. God almighty. Designed for civilian use, I'm told, but we both know they can be used for fighter planes. This is total madness. Trade should have no boundaries, says the Chancellor of the Exchequer. If we don't sell the Germans' engines, somebody else will. And I suppose there's some sort of logic in that. What are we doing here, Van? We make recommendations, write briefing notes, nobody listens. Nobody in Downing Street gives a damn. Well, they're not very interested in uncomfortable things like political reality. Germans aren't allowed to rearm. 
Try telling that to Mr. Hitler. Well, then why doesn't the government do something? They don't want to provoke another war. Who does? And they feel guilty. About what? The Treaty of Versailles. It was far too punitive. Robbed the Germans of their self-esteem. He's tired out, ma'am. I'm getting him ready for bed. Thank you, Ethel. Should we go up? Mr. Baldwin believes a strong Germany will keep Russia in its place. The government regards the communists as a greater threat than the Nazis. And are they? I think not. Nazism is more than just a political movement. It's a cult. A religion based on the idea of racial purity. Mankind, the Nazis believe, is divided between the man-gods and the subhumans. Aliens who will be used as beasts of burden or merely disposed of. Those with pure Aryan blood are the man-gods. The beasts are the Jews. You ready for bed? You ready for bed? Charlie. Charlie. Oh, Charlie, my boy. Mm. You ready for bed? Yes, you ready for bed? Oh, sweet dreams, big man. Good night, sweetheart. Good night. <laughs> What part of Germany are you from, Herr Baron? Bavaria, some ten miles from Munich. Do you know it? I was there last year with my family. On holiday? No, researching for my book on the uh, Duke of Marlborough. Having a look at the battlefields. How very exciting. Mm. One has to visit the actual uh, places, so tread the terrain, as it were. We nearly had tea with Hitler. <laughs> In Munich? Mm. At the Ambassador's Hotel. The Regina Hotel. The Ambassador's in Vienna. Please don't interrupt me when I'm trying to interrupt you. Herr <laughs> <laughs> uh, Schroeder, have you ever seen Herr Hitler? I've met him. Really? Uh, when was this? Quite recently. I was having dinner with France. Hitler was a principal guest. What's he like? My first impression, insignificance. Utterly insignificant. A grey face, slate grey. Melancholy jet black eyes, like raisins. <laughs> a figure out of a ghost story. He took on and on endlessly. Out of Parsifal, he said, I shall make a religion. His oily hair fell into his face when he read it. Then, uh, quite suddenly, he left. He bowed to me like a waiter who has just received a fair tip. When he left, nobody moved. Nobody spoke. We all sat in silence. Rather like this. <laughs> After the Great War, we were told that Germany would be a democracy with parliamentary institutions. All this has been swept away. What do you have? Dictatorship. The most grim dictatorship. You have the, the persecution of the Jews, you have militarism, and appeals to every form of fighting spirit. The Baldwin won't like that. He sincerely believes that Hitler does not want war. Baldwin. Not just Baldwin, many others. Well, they're wrong. Well, you think so, I think so. But don't underestimate them, Winston. They admire Hitler. Genuinely, they won't like it. Well, they can lump it. Order! Order! You have dictatorship. It's grim dictatorship. Robert! You have the... Order! Order! You have the persecution of the Jews. You have militarism. It appeals to every form of fighting spirit. Germany wants peace. We have steadily marched backwards since the Great War. We've had enough bloodshed. Years are greater. Rivalries are sharper. Military plans are more closely concerned backwards since the Great War. We've had enough bloodshed. Years are greater. Rivalries are sharper. 
military plans are more closely concerted, and because of our disarmament, Britain is weaker. Order! Order! The right of the gentleman must be heard. The war mentality, the war mentality is springing up again. Britain's hour of weakness is Europe's hour of danger. Mr. Mr. Speaker, although one is loath to criticise anyone in the evening of his days, nothing can excuse the right honourable member for Epping for having permeated his entire speech with the atmosphere that Germany is arming for war. Mr. Speaker, may I remind the right honourable member that a poll conducted by the League of Nations found that over 90% of the British people favour international disarmament. And let us not forget that a child born on the day the Great War ended is now just old enough to die in the next Great War. It is our duty, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that there is no next Great War. This country wants peace. People say, oh, Winston won't mind. He's used to being shouted at. But they're wrong. It hurts deeply. Especially from your own party. The Tories don't want to be made to think. What you're saying is right. That's what matters. They don't listen. That's what matters. Like banging your head against a brick wall. Mm. One can't go on forever. Most men of my age are retired. Do a bit of gardening, enjoy a spot of golf. Enjoy a few years of quietude. And die. All those dreams of standing shoulder to shoulder with Marlborough and all the other heroes is stupid nonsense. If you give up now, then you'll never know. Give up? Give up what? There's nothing that gave up. You're depressed. Black dog's barking. Perhaps he's barking the truth. Winston, do you remember last year when Inches fell ill? Mm. It wasn't the flu. It was something more serious. Why didn't you tell me? Because he told me not to. The doctor said he should give up work completely, but he refused. Mr. Churchill needs me, he said. And it's not just inches, it's Mrs. P, the staff, your constituency workers, me. We're all the same. You have the ability to make people carry on no matter what. You're only trying to cheer me up. Well, don't. Winston, all these years I've put up with the miseries of political life because I believe in you. And somehow I survived. But to have you here all the time in retirement, bad-tempered, getting in everybody's way. That is something I just could not survive. <laughs> mm. You're getting pretty good at this, Winston. Mm. 90 brick an hour. Isn't that right, Harry? Uh, nearer to 60, I should say, sir. Oh, very well, very well. Between 60 and 90. Uh, and I've become a, a member of the Amalgamated Union of Building Workers. That's fully paid up. Very good. Uh, this um, material you're feeding me about the German Air Force, it's uh, too generalized. Facts and figures, that's what I need. Not easy. That stuff doesn't come in my direction. Uh, so how do I get hold of it? To be honest, I don't think you can. Top secret. Eyes only. Go straight to the Foreign Office. Uh, see what you can do. I got thrashed again in the house last week. I need some muscle, Desmond. I need to fight back. Come in. Ah, oh, Rafe, I thought you left ages ago. Well, I've been reading this. Drink? Yes. It's a report from Berlin. Hitler's cabinet has approved a new law. It means, in effect, the compulsory sterilization of all those suffering from hereditary illnesses which are deemed, and I quote, to affect the health of the nation. Mm, bad. Racial purity. This. This is just the beginning. And word with the Prime Minister. Much good.
stupid, that'll do. He'll just say it's German domestic policy and has nothing to do with us. Which is true. In all honesty, Rafe, there's very little I can do, if anything. You, on the other hand, may think otherwise. Have you brought any of this to the attention of the government? I've tried. I've sent briefing notes to Mr. Baldwin and all members of the cabinet. Have you had any reaction? Nobody pays any attention. Hitler's war machine's getting more powerful every day, and the British public's been deliberately misinformed. Or at least deliberately kept in the dark. I've made a summary of the figures issued by the government comparing our military strength with that of Germany. On the next page of my own figures, which are much nearer the truth, Germany will soon be strong enough to wage an aggressive war, which is what I believe they intend to do. Your figures are very precise. Much more so than the information I have. Presumably, you have access to other reports, other statistics. All of it is as precise and detailed as this. Far more detailed. As I say, this is only a summary. Well, I don't see how I can help you. Well, your position... I may be called director of the Industrial Intelligence Center, but don't be fooled. I'm no more than a civil servant. I have no public voice, which is what you need. Yes, it is. In that case, I think you should talk to Winston. Winston? Churchill? Mm. Surely he's... Past it? I don't trust him. First he joins the Tory party, and then he switches to the Liberals, and now he's back with the Tories again. He has no judgment. Maybe. He has an extraordinary instinct. He knows when something's important and should be pursued. He's wrong about India, of course. He's been wrong about a lot of things. And I believe he's right about Germany. I shall be seeing him at the weekend. If you'd like me to take anything down to Chartwell, I shall be happy to do so. That would mean... You're suggesting that I remove secret documents from a government office and show them to someone who has no right to see them? It's a criminal act. Well, perhaps a necessary one. Marjorie? Yes, Mr. Whitram? Uh, an envelope. I need a, a large envelope. An envelope? Yes, do we have any large envelopes? How large? Uh, just to take some papers, just an ordinary large size envelope. Oh, if you give the papers to me, I'll post them for you. What's the address? Uh, no, no, it's, it's nothing to do with work. Where, where, where do we keep the envelopes? Is this big enough for you? It's fine, perfect. back in the office first thing Monday morning, so I need them back by Sunday evening at the latest. You have my word. If it says, don't walk on the grass, I never do. Never used to. Sunday evening, then. Sunday evening. in the foreign office, Rafe Wigram, head of the central department. Risky business, pinching this. Do you get this? Cab in the foreign office, Rafe Wigram, head of the central department. Risky business, pinching this. Useful? Mm. This will make the buggers jump. <laughs> Half past eleven. Who the hell is he? 
Morton promised. Well, perhaps you should telephone. Telephone who? Don't they know how important this is? Hello? Mr. Wigram? Yes. Brendan Bracken. Just returning that. Sorry I'm late. Car broke down. Bloody nuisance. There's a note in there from Winston. He'd love to have you come down for Sunday lunch. He'll be in touch. Good night. Good night. Mr. Churchill? Mr. Speaker, before I am derided yet again, and before any further insults are hurled at me in the uh, evening of my days. It's nearly midnight, Winston. Let me give you some facts and figures, some food for thought. Let me describe to you the method of aircraft manufacture in Hitler's Germany. Sit down, Winston. We've heard it all before. This you will not have heard. I can assure you of that. Aeroplanes, aeroplanes destined for the Luftwaffe are not manufactured in one place. Throughout Germany, a large number of firms are making seemingly innocent component parts, which are then dispatched to great central factories where they are assembled very rapidly into fighter and bomber aircraft, like a jigsaw puzzle or Meccano game. It's very clever, very effective, and above all, it conceals the true scale of German rearmament. I am uh, reliably informed that the, the working population of Dessau, a small town near Leipzig, increased last year by 13,000 people. And why was that? <laughs> what is uh, manufactured in Dessau that requires such, such an enormous influx of workers? Lager beer? Hmm? <laughs> Lederhosen? <laughs> Sausages? <laughs> Aircraft. Yeah. That is why I say we must act decisively, and we must act now, to put our defenses in order. If we do not, history will cast its verdict with those terrible, chilling words, too late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Ferguson? The right honourable gentleman, the member for oh. Aiking, has... <laughs> Charlie would so love a dog. Oh, I'm sure we could find you one. Off you go. <laughs> I'm afraid our garden's too small. It's the size of a postage stamp. Well, we have an absolute menagerie here. Winston has cats, dogs, geese, donkeys, wild swans, pigs, not to mention the children. <laughs> Don't know how you manage. I've written my own epitaph. Here lies a woman who was always tired, because she lived in a world where too much was required. <laughs> well, landscape's your speciality. Hmm. Well, oh, yes. Less troublesome than uh, portraits. A tree can't tell me that I haven't done it justice. <laughs> Don't know how you find time for painting. Oh, I wouldn't do it without it. It keeps me sane. I mean it. This couldn't exist without uh, paints and brushes. The black dog will get me. Are you a warrior? Yes, I'm afraid I am. Well, then you should definitely take up painting. It's good for the spirit, calms the nerves. What do you worry about? Almost everything, really. Mm. My wife, my son. Are they happy? Will they be all right? State of my finances, state of the world, state of my roof. The what? My roof. We have a leaky roof every time it rains. Mm -hmm. It's a nightmare. Mm. But most of all, I'm, I'm worried about these papers, these documents I'm showing you. If anyone were to find out, I'd be in the most terrible trouble. Nobody would find out. Don't worry, Rafe. It's all strictly confidential. May I call you Rafe if it's not too sudden? Please do. The, uh, the recognizing and acknowledging of fear is a mark of wisdom. 
For example, I can't stand too near the edge of a platform when a, an express train is passing through. The second's action would end everything forever. My doctor says it's a form of melancholia. We call it my black dog. Painting drives it away, as does uh, bricklaying. I'm building a wall. It goes well with writing. 2,000 words, 200 bricks a day. What's the time? I feel peckish. Um, it's nearly four o'clock. I knew it. Time for tea. When we have visitors, we have Dundee cake. Yes, it's a great treat these days. I'm particularly fond of Dundee cake. Come on, Rafe. I'll take these. You bring the easel. My old man said, follow the bell, and don't dilly dally. Oh, come on, don't try and fold it up. It's a bloody nightmare. And don't dilly dally on the way. I hear you went to Chartwell. Yes. Have fun. Yes, yes, we did, rather. I didn't know you were chummy with Winston. Well, I'm not. Not, uh, chummy. I wonder what he wants you for. What do you mean? Winston's so-called friends are all people who are useful to him. The idea of having a friend simply because you like someone has no place in Winston's world. You have to be very careful. What on? He demands total loyalty. Thou shalt have no other guards for me. Do you know what Lloyd George said of him? He said he would make a drum of his own mother's skin in order to sound his own praises. <laughs> article for? The Daily Mail. Damn good at the Daily Mail. Big fee, big readership. What more could a fellow ask? Walter Guinness telephoned this morning. Mm. How is he? He's very well. He's asked me to go on a cruise. Cruise? Very nice. More of an expedition, really. Fine. You'll enjoy a little rest. Where's, uh, where's Walter planning to go? South of France? Komodo. Komodo? Hmm. Where the hell's that? <laughs> Just below the Philippines, near Bali. Philippines is halfway around the bloody world. What on earth makes him want to go there? Something to do with catching dragons. Dragons? Well, they're more lizards, really, but they're very big. And they're for the zoo. Wait, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait a minute. Walter Guinness is seriously suggesting going halfway down the world searching for some damn lizards. Is that right? Well, yes. You must be mad. What's the point of it? Well, it would be a great adventure. You'd be away weeks, months. About four months. What is going on this trip? Evelyn, of course. Two of their cousins. A man called Terence Phillip. Who's he? Art dealer. We met him at one of Walter's dinner parties. Clemmy, you have four children who require your love and support, not to mention a husband who has to work 20 hours a day to keep this household afloat. And you think it's all right, do you, to leave us to go off chasing lizards with Walter Guinness? What am I supposed to say to that? Well, don't you think it just might be construed as just a little selfish? Well, don't you, huh? Winston, do not accuse me of being selfish. Do not 